I'm just going to throw it on the main page of BSQ if you like, you know? Yeah. Increases the traffic of the site, you know? Yeah. I mean, right, like Bitly. Gonna go. Have y'all like fucked that Bitly boy? Uh, what did Like, Libya, yeah. So, like, during that whole day, the whole lot of the Yeah, the DNS and everything. Um, yeah, like, uh, the micronation of Tuvalu has been making, like, a huge amount of money. Dot TV. Yeah, when they were parsing out of the dot dot UK, dot whatever. Tuvalu was like, you know one. one. They're like, all right, you get dot TV, whatever. And then, like, as the internet starts oh. to mature, yeah, yeah, it's like, like twenty percent of their federal budget is like comes from revenue from like leasing out. That's so sick. <laughs> Did you ever have a .tk website back in the day? Uh, not to memory. It was a free website that I don't know. It was like free, like a free forwarding address that a country would give out Ooh. to people. So we'd have something on free webs, and then we'd have it on like a .tk website. The only way to not. I even do really well. Yeah. Talking like seven sister. Back in that day. Back in the, the good old days. Back in that day. Oh, so you did go. Look at it. Like, I almost look like I had fun with it. Like, I saw. What's the rule? That was the Tumblr. Oh, you did it? This was the Tumblr. All right, so that works. Yes. Yes. One of the 
going to do this part. I'm good. I got something. Thanks. I'm good. Thanks. Petra. Oh, it automatically did it through Twitter, right? She was only mentioned once last night, and every night, and it was like the best. Goodbye. Mean Christian Paul brought her up. You guys are live streaming, you know that, right? Yeah. Public record. Gotta be careful. Um, Christian Paul was really great. It was a little. Okay, so there are a lot of logistical problems with it. They sold that to the lead. They didn't have heats for most of the people there. They only like had a few of the crafts, basically. And like, yeah. like, a hundred or twelve rounds. And then after, and like, they know how the internet works. <laughs> it was really bizarre. And they gave us like all the free pizza and beer, and then there was like nowhere to sit down and do like live food commentary. So a lot of people ended up in like the live stream of the which was really funny. There was a minute later show that we were done in the video. I thought I'll go to the minute, which is really surprising. Surprising. And then Dom had the first one. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't think I, I, I know his name, but I don't think I have any reason for it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Oh, cool. Uh, I see that. Yeah, lift that phone up. I see you standing there. At a certain at a certain point, pretty soon here, we should just prop the door. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Yeah. As there as there is an influx, an ingress. Uh, I found them lovely. I think the most thing is that he's kind of like figuring out. You guys want to sit here for a little? Oh, yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. Hey, Joe. Is that that good? Your that fat ball you carry. Uh -huh.
Screens and how to print in the bathroom and all the stuff. Um, that yeah. Yeah. Next week, I'm going to do one. It's either a yeah. or yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not a basketball. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, but um, so yeah, so we'll talk. Well, that would be what? I just meant with the most thing I Especially when you have to have there. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to help them. So I'll just get some hours. 
It's a busy week. He left Cuba, Cuba with his sister Gloria, and he was sent to Spain. And then uh, he moved to Puerto Rico to live with his uncle. In 1976, he graduates from high school in San Juan and studies at Puerto Rico University, where he starts to concentrate on classes related to literature, poetry, and the fine arts. And eventually, he experiments with ephemeral art installations using fugitive materials such as fabric and ice. In 1979, he moved to New York and attended Pratt Institute, where he pursues uh, experimentation with video art and photo photography, and produces his first press insertion, a newspaper project with the title Environmental Pollution, uh, which was published in El Nuevo Dia on August 24, 1980. Uh, he studied at the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. In 1981 and 1983. During this time, he continues to show a series of photographs that address conceptual approaches to the medium and to produce works that combine video, 
installation and performance. Uh, the text, this is an early photograph from 1983, the text, the balloon text that he circles says Reagan expanding trident program, which will come out later in the lecture. So we'll have other pieces. Uh, in 1987, he received an MFA from the International Center of Photography and NYU, and he joined Group Material, uh, an artist collective known for their political activism. And their eighth timeline, which was first installed at the Berkeley York Museum in 1989. Uh, in 1988, they produced inserts, booklets of artist pages inserted into the May 22nd Sunday New York Times. In 1988, he has uh, solo exhibitions in New York at the New Museum of Contemporary Art, in Tar, in tar Latin America Gallery, and Rostovsky Gallery where he exhibits his first stack piece, untitled, consisting of endless photocopies on a wooden pedestal. Uh, this is an installation of the New Museum. The painting is titled Forbidden Colors. Uh, as the press release reads, it is a fact that four colors, red, black, green, and white, placed next to each other in any form are strictly forbidden by the Israeli army in the occupied Palestinian territories. This color combination can cause an arrest, a beating, a curfew, a shooting, or a news photograph. Yet it is a fact that these forbidden colors presented as a solitary act, consciousness here in Soho, will not precipitate a similar reaction. Uh, he uses the same dateline format as we saw in the stack to create a series of small discrete pieces in an inexpensive commercial material called photostat, so similar to a photocopy. Uh, the presentation was really informal, and it's just this document, diploma style frames that are presented in. And this is from 1989, installed in Sheridan Square, part of a project that, uh, that was sponsored by the Public Art Fund to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion. It's the last of the black and white dateline pieces that focused on public and public events as he shifts to making portrait pieces that show private and public. So in 1989, he creates a self-portrait combining a series of public and private events and dates and has it painted as a frieze of the Brooklyn Museum. The invitation was part of a series of one-person shows where the curator intended to blur the line between public space and exhibition space by installing works in the museum's grand foyer. Since a number of projects had already preceded his, Felix chose to address a space in the museum that was truly marginal. He opened up the translucent shades that hid the museum's relationship to the open botanic gardens and placed two large and very green potted plants in front of the windows, drawing attention to the usually invisible landscape of the gardens. And the text reads, Red Canoe, 1987, Paris, 1985, Blue Flowers, 1984, Harry the Dog, 1983, Blue Lake, 1986, and Tapira, 1989, and Ross, 1980. So the last entry refers to the year he met his life partner, Ross Laycock, who died in 1991, and who also inspired much of Felix's you know, best known work, uh, such as a series of puzzles that were snippets from love letters that Ross had written to him, uh, shot of the series. This is Ross scuba diving. Lovers, which everybody knows. Portrait of Ross in LA. So, uh, we're up to the first hand these two. That's not the first hand. It's uh, Fortune Cookie Clinic. Um, so, I'll talk about that. So, we're up to 1989. In 1989, he receives a fellowship from the NEA and begins moving his signature stacks directly onto the floor and creates his first of eight curtain pieces. 
which along with the portraits, the billboards, the stacks, and the canvas builds, become five signature bodies of work, manifestable works, unique works that can be exhibited or manifested in more than one place at a time. Without impugning the work's uniqueness, unique, uniqueness is defined by its ownership. This is the first pattern for him. Uh, the beginning, the golden, chemo, blood, water. So also this year he collaborated with Louise Lawler to create this stack of kind of beautiful. Uh, he uses a news image of the American Trident, two missiles spiraling out of control, and the text supplied by Louise. Uh, and this sort of fixes the New York Times as a source of inspiration for the original clipping from August 25th, 1989. So in 1990, he taught at uh, uh, CalArts, Valencia. He taught classes in the subject social landscape and AIDS and its representations. He taught similar classes in New York at NYU. Turning a, turning a class on urban photography, a class designed to teach students how to take photographs in an urban setting, into a theoretical class on urban, the urban landscape, in which he emphasized the importance of developing methods, the importance of the process that brings you to make the choice to be an artist. He introduced students to a diverse roster of theorists and influences such as Louis-Pierre Althusser, Bertolt Brecht, E. Devore, Michel Foucault, Walt Benjamin, and Celia, Celia Cruz. Uh, he would perpetually recontextualize information with the students, for example, by reading excerpts from the New York Times while Jane Fonda's workout tape played in the back. <laughs> uh, the form of public lectures were also essential to him and continued his view of teaching as a form of cultural act and a form of creative change at a very basic level. So, in 1990, he makes his first image, which only which was a half good fortune. Because Ross had a bad fortune for being a restaurant. And then he went on to make 20 candy pieces. Corner Bocci, the same day, Mr. Momo. Uh, in 1991, he creates his first piece using light bulbs. This is untitled March 5th, number two. You can see the coupling motif that reoccurs throughout the work. March 5th was Ross's birthday. Uh, also, this year, 1991, he creates a four part exhibition at Andrea Rosen Gallery called Every Week There's Something. Uh, so each week the exhibition changes. Week two, the dancer uh, only shows up for about five minutes a day unannounced and dances to music that only he can hear uh, on his leather walk and now. So it's a little Week three, the And I wanted to show this because um, when I talked later about the show in New York traveling show, Karen Bovey actually recreated this installation in the Bible Foundation. Uh, so in 1991, he participates in the Whitney Biennial as an individual artist and also as a member of group material. Uh, he shows entitled Deck by Gun and entitled Lover Boys, a candy piece here. The ideal weight is 355 pounds, the combined weight of the other Uh, Death by Gun, which is, of course, continually relevant. Um, it used pictures of all the people killed by handguns in the U.S. in one week and was derived from an article in Time magazine. And the NRA uh, actually bought all the back issues of the magazine because it was impossible to, almost impossible to find a copy. Uh, 
Um, this year, he starts to make 16 identical light strings made of 42 light bulbs with porcelain light sockets. So they're 16 feet in length. Each one identical with a unique parenthetical title. The uh, Toronto, Miami, Lucent, Me, Rossmore, of course, Scott, of course, this is the three Americas. Uh, so although identical, each string is a unique work whose installation is collaboratively completed by the owner or borrower each time it is installed. By 1993, uh, he's created his final staff. He's intentionally his final staff. Uh, Passport 2, which uh, for a total of 40 staffs. And he creates his final candy piece uh, entitled Placebo Landscape for Ronnie for a total of 20 candy pieces. And this is dedicated to Ronnie Horn, who became friends with after he did the show. So then, um, in 1994, Felix had a uh, solo exhibition in the U.S. called Traveling. He went to the of L.A., the Hirschhorn Museum in D.C., and the Renaissance Society in Chicago. Uh, the exhibition features several works with one of his signature motifs, the bird in the sky, uh, which is a metaphor for travel and migration. This is a piece that I meant to show the Loka L.A. exhibition shop. Actually, he's at the New Museum right now, the 1993 show. This is when it was first installed in the Bay Rose. So, in 1994, he um, creates America, the last of his 24 light pieces, light strings that are made over a period of two years, uh, which he referred to as his own history of light. And uh, this is it installed in the rank. Anyway, it's the only light piece that can go outdoors as well as indoors. Um, so then in 1994, he died in January 96. After uh, viewers have become accustomed to the takeaway um, Malleable nature of the work, so much of his work. Um, he purposefully returned to the wall and created photographs in extremely small editions. Uh, this intentional reversal of his practice was meant to once again investigate the nature of value and preciousness of the art object and question the conceptual and professional connotations of value regarding traditions and multiples in relationship to unique works. There are some photographs in this series. Birds in the sky, you can see them here. But these are uh, from a series called Vultures, which is the last uh, these are photographs that he made. In 1995, he has a retrospective exhibition at the Guggenheim and creates his last version of the self portrait uh, for exhibition in the second venue of the Guggenheim Museum uh, at the CGA C in Spain which opened on December 12, 1995, about a month before he passed away. Um, images from the Guggenheim retrospective. This is the food shop. And then, so this was the sixth and final version of his portrait that he created during his life. How it grew from when it was first installed at the museum. And uh, the piece is now um, owned by, it was purchased in 2003 by the Art Institute of Chicago and the SF MoMA. Um, as co owners, they share the right to make changes to the portrait in the future and to lend that right to authorized borrowers. So I think today there's been about 26 versions. Um, so now I just want to talk a little bit about the novelty of the work. I already mentioned that 
unique works can exist in more than one location at a time, but they can also vary from installation to installation. So while Gonzalez Torres assigned an ideal measurement to the weight and height of the work, the use of the word ideal to refer to these measurements signals that they are malleable, as Gonzalez Torres intended. You can see from the sample wall text, the ideal height is chosen by Felix for the Jeff Lagun stack with nine inches. The original paper size was 33 by 45 inches. It's made in the future in another institution. It doesn't need to be installed at that height. It doesn't need to be installed, printed at that paper size. Um, the term original refers to the description of choices made in the first manifestation. This applies to size, shape, candy, and paper type. Subsequent manifestations may deviate from the original or first manifestation within the specific yet open-ended parameters of the work. So the principle of continued choice is essential. Um, so I just wanted to show a few examples of during his lifetime when he installed candies in different forms. Public opinion, from 1991, which went by Guggenheim. This is the title of Revenge. 91 and then 94 at the Renaissance Society. And this is Welcome Back Heroes. Uh, one for the first time and then in his Cuban high retrospective. Um, ease of manifestation was a priority for him. So this allows for source the, the, the materials to be sourced locally whenever they're manifested. Candy, it doesn't need to be the original candy that Felix chose. We use the original, original candy as a guideline. Same with the paper type. Um, it's always using the original or the first manifestation as a guideline. When an owner agrees to lend a piece, a manifestable piece, they are passing on this right and responsibility to make choices about that manifestation. Um, and they're just releasing that right and responsibility to borrow for the duration of the lesson. Um, so this fulfills Felix's you know, ultimate goal for the work to continue to exist over time and to embrace change and evolution. And one of the primary goals of the foundation is to keep a recorded archive of all these variations and iterations uh, and the record of the decisions that, made, that go into making those choices. So now I wanted to just go on quickly talk about this traveling exhibition that was in um, Europe in 2010 and 2011. It was created by Elena Filipovich, uh, who is curator at the Wheels Center for Contemporary Arts in Brussels. And uh, she was assigned or asked to curate a retrospective of Felix's work. And she felt that that was impossible, given the model nature of the work and how, how, cha how essential change is to it. Um, but she saw it as a challenge and heard what, the solution she came up with was to, for each venue, she asked a young artist to come in and rehang the show without any obligation to her original checklist. Um, and the three artists were young artists that were conceptually informed in some way by Felix. Uh, so the first one was Jan Vo at Wheels. The second one was Carol Bay. Bay. I don't know which one is it. Is it a book for me? Carol Bay at the Foundation Byler. And I think Tina Segal at the MMK in Frankfurt. Um, so first let's start with a comparison of Elena and John's installations. Uh, wall text that um, created the show. This is Elena's installation. This is changes like Yang made. 
plants. Yango took a lot of things down, <laughs> and there was actually a lot of complaints from people who came after Elena Show and had seen images of Elena Show in the press, and were like, "We want our money back. Where's all the work?" So, the museum director is like, "This is America and Silo." America installed in the countryside. They were going to install it in the public area in the city, but they told me they didn't get the proper permits. The piece is incredibly difficult to, to uh, exhibit and get permits for it. So um, they installed it uh, at one of the um, employees of the museum's house. It's now we're going to move on to the bio there. Did anybody see this in Boston? Yes. Um, this is Elena's installation. You can see how they contextualized it with, uh, contextualized Felix's work with the permanent collection of bio. Um, you can see how Carol did really minimal changes. She changed, this is untitled Stockholm, it's a 12 part light stream piece. She just changed the width of the lights that they were like. She basically kept everything the same. Uh, so Elena's two stacks. Carol kept the same. Um, Felix's portrait and that very first stack. Carol kept the same. The go platform and put the sculpture back and moves the platform into a staging area downstairs. And this is Elena's installation, which will become the staging area, or the storage area, I should say, for Carol. <laughs> Left the blood work drawings on the wall and the wall tents. But uh, welcome back. You can see your stack there. Great. This is a um, this is an entrance to conservation area. So when you walked into this during the latest show, you saw this: the double mirror, the two chandeliers, and the light stream on the floor. You can see this up there. And then uh, Carol recreated the architecture of the Rosa Gallery and installed that show that I showed earlier every week or something different. This is the Byler, her version. That was the Gallery version, but this is the Byler. This is the Byler. Gallery, Byler. Gallery, Byler. <laughs> This one is going. No. Gallery. And she, um, as you can see, she didn't make any that many changes upstairs. And she, basically, what she did is she lived there for about a month or two, and she was the caretaker of the work. She replenished the stash, replenished the candies. Make sure the light bulbs were changed. Um, and she kept a diary of that experience. Okay, right, so now we're going to move on to Pei, Tina Stahl. This is the Salamis installation. People were kind of disconcerted when they saw that in the portrait, Felix's portrait, there was Obama. Uh, 2008, and it was like confusing people how that could be in, in a different portrait, like that's the wrong now, but the portrait can change as time progresses and is intended to. Um, Elena installed USA Today in two locations in the museum, inside the museum. 
uh, blue fabric curtain across the street from the museum in the apartment. This is uh, been installed in a shop in Frankfurt. And just by chance, the guy on the right was walking by. <laughs> <laughs> He's known as uh, Naked York. <laughs> he has a permit to walk around naked. Um, he has an allergy to textiles. <laughs> I'm afraid that we just have to do that. Um, OK, so this is uh, a map that was created after Tino Segal's choreography. What Tino did is he made six different installations that um, were in constant flux throughout the day. So if you went to the museum, you saw all these works being moved around and all these installations being created. Um, this is his staging area. These are the, some tools that they devised to aid in moving the candies and facts. And this is um, some images of sort of the choreography that the students created to help them remember what they were supposed to do. Those are created by Tino. Um, these are some diagrams uh, which illustrate the changes. So the first one is called curated, and then it went to minimal, and you can see, I mean, these are symbols for the different pieces, but you can see how like things here, things here, placebo is more to this form, to this room. So if, we're going to do a book that's going to document all these changes. Um, but I just wanted to give you a general idea. So there's one called number four. There's one with just like strings. Uh, there's one that's all about contents. And then another curated version. So First one, as you can see, he lined up all the stacks and the line along the axis of the architecture of the museum. He unpaid a portrait of dad uh, with public opinion, with black and white pieces installed across from each other in this mirrored way. Um, this is minimal insulation. <coughs> Saw the curtain at the elevator bank. Minimal floor. Only light string. Content, he installed the photostats on the floor. Uh, he installed the four stats, square formation, put the blue mirror on the floor here. Install these stats in inside the doorways, you actually can step over them. And then this is America installed on the outside of the museum. This is installed in the square nearby the lantern. Um, so next I just wanted to show a short video that documents what you would sort of experience if you went during Tino's show, during the Tino's part. Um, yeah. If you just like close the window there, um, I think it should be. Thank <laughs> you. 
If you were there when they were doing that, you could actually smell the candy and it stirred up the aroma of the candy. It was the idea that it was never, I mean, the internet building on the day was not going to be installed. Constantly going to be installed. Right, I mean, there was never a day when it was sad. I mean, I remember today we'd take a break, okay, but this is so great. Pushing into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and we're serious, we're we popping serious actors. They're not actors, they were students that were a volunteer, or they're paid to pay. Yeah, but the instructor. Yeah, the instructor. The golf. Yeah.
information ever again. How long? Um, each one was about six weeks. Like her show would be up for six weeks, and then they would do Yasuo's show. So that's why her show would open up, and there'd be all this press about it, and there's images in the press, and then these old ladies would show up, and they'd be, where's the print? You know? So things like that would happen. And then Yans or whoever's would be up for another six weeks, approximately. It was her conception that everything that she knew about the internet are the artist's curious. Yes. Yeah, they became curious. You worked with Felix for one year after I wrote this? Yeah, for two years. What kind of guy would you like? He was amazing. He was um, incredibly generous, um, very rigorous. Hysterical, great sense of humor. Um, it's a really special person. Really special. And how do you like to collect toys, right? Yeah. Did you ever go to toy shopping or anything? No, but I, I have some. It's actually with after you died. Julie Alt and Andrea decided to disseminate toys amongst friends and colleagues. So I have some in my bedroom. Would you write? I just got that book of his where he wrote like, um, on the back of pictures, like, I guess he kind of just like, sent them out to people. Um, but that are, like, off the back yeah, of it was his way of like, in correspondence, he'd take snapshots, or he'd put like, the, the toy figures in bed together, or, like, you know, Fred and Dino or something. <laughs> you'd take a picture of it and send it to a friend with a funny, funny caption on the back, or a poignant caption sometimes just with funny backs. Yeah, you, know, you just come back from a break and you have like a snapshot of your computer, on your keyboard of your computer. It's very, it's all about, a lot about this idea of the gift and sharing. To the joy of living, he had a real joy of living. That was really fascinating. Who were some artists that you that you really looked up to? Um. Well, I know he really admired Ronnie Ronnie Horn's work. Um, Ronnie Horn. Um, but things that I've heard, we, we're actually do we do an oral history project at the foundation, and things that I've heard from people that knew him was that if they ever saw him out in Soho or about and, and asked about like have you seen anything great, he was always really generous about saying like I saw this amazing show. You know, there's never like this jealousy about artistic um, uh, you know, pettiness or. Competition or anything. He just, but if he saw something he really liked, he, saw, he said that's really good work. I remember him saying that about John Landers when I was there when they hit the gallery. So, and Jim Hodges, he had a relationship with his friend. Um, I don't know how he felt about the work. <laughs> What's the, uh, I guess this is somewhat related, like what are, what are some of the like, conceptual kind of like foundations? Like, as he, like in his education, yeah, what were the what were like those guys like texts? Maybe like what kind of text was he doing? I'm thinking he's very like what kind of what kind of text did he read or write? Read? Like formative. Do you know do you have any idea like what the kind of like formative text were they were anything like that? Like he relates to certain breath. He was in breath. Um co um had various sources for inspirational. Who's um, Gadar, um, Situationist, um, Joseph Sooth, who's really influential. Um, and then also, you know, the Golden Girls or popular culture. And like those photostats are meant to reference television screens. And so there's a blank, really black, glossy. Like slate at the top, and then there's sort of cultural references at the bottom. And you know, he when he first started out, he was waiting tables, and he would come out and like just flip through all these channels, and he was just like bombarded by this information that I think had an effect on him creating these works. He was sort of big, big pieces. Um, so it was, it was the gamut. You know, he used to, um, you know, the, the Jane Fonda thing with his students. He used one of my favorite uh, assignments that I used to get the students that I heard about was that he would send them to 
magazine shopped by one of those like specialty magazines, like you know, like Civil War magazine, or you know, sort of like just looking at the ads that were in the back of that magazine. What does that reveal about the sort of subculture? What does it tell us about our culture in general? And just things like that. <laughs> you mentioned Julian and Andreas, so the question I was going to ask for you is um, what do you think would you like to talk about how his inclusion how would you in group material help down his aesthetic? Um, yeah, I think you know Julie would be able to speak to that better than I, because by the time I started working with him. He had concluded his dissertation in group material. Um, there's a book, there's a great book about group material. Um, and also Julie wrote this book, which you're welcome to look at, that I really recommend for anybody interested in Felix's work. It has a compendium of you know, all the text, all the press releases that Felix wrote, some of the lectures that he gave, um, all the text, the best text in the book about him. Um, One, if not two, that I'm remembering uh, times that this is noted as taking time away from that scene. Yeah. And that's, I had actually been hoping, hoping to ask that question myself. Um, it's, so, like, what was his activity in the especially active? I've never been able to get a fix on that, like where he was in the group. I think he was active in the AIDS timeline project. Um, it's a great question. I don't know. Research now. Um, but you know, part of what I wanted to do with the beginning part of the lecture was to convey how intense and short his career came about and kind of things that were going on culturally with the AIDS epidemic and then, you know, pending, pending lover dying, father died the same year, um, you know, all these friends were dying. He knew he was sick, he didn't share it publicly very much, but, but um, so the sort of urgency about everything while it's all going on is a really intense time. Um, but it all came together. You know, and he, like I said, he purposely stopped making those bodies of work because he was the one to So, and the numbers he chose for those. 20 candy pieces, 40 stacks. Those were intentional numbers, numbers that had a certain uh, uncanny resonance. And numbers that were uncomfortable, he was uncomfortable around with being a PC described as being uncomfortable, like a 17 or 15 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Does it ever feel sort of heavy or uncomfortable or depressing? Sort of in a way, gatekeeper or sort of like a caretaker of his memory in some ways, or is that something that you really get up this distance? Uh, well, part of our job is to always remind people that you know the work's not about AIDS and death, and it's about all these other cool things. Um, that's really rewarding for me to constantly be reminding people about these other nuances in the work. Um, I mean, you're definitely working with a dead artist, so or not with, but working um, on the archives of the dead artist. And the, the great part about the work is that it does change and grow. It's like not working with a traditional archive or traditional foundation. So I feel very lucky in that sense. Um, you mean because of malleability? Yeah. yeah. So it's more dynamic. Then. Yeah, than you know maybe some other painter. So the foundation is it? Um, do you also archive like do you look at his notes and like stuff like that? Uh, yeah, we have the, the personal papers are owned by the estate, but we do have access to them as research. research also. Is there? Uh, I don't think I've ever seen like a, any kind of like collected papers or anything like that. 
Is there any, is that he? Yeah, he didn't make very many drawings, and he intentionally didn't want his drawings out there in the world. Um, you know, one of the things is that he didn't have a studio. Um, his half his apartment was in the studio, and when he would put something out in an exhibition, it was sort of acting as a studio, sort of looking at it, saying like, what was successful or what was not successful. And that's one of the reasons that he had some arts that he struck from the exclusion. It was like editing in your studio saying, like, this doesn't work. You know? and I don't want it to be a part of my body of work. I'm just known for it. Did he agree with people like taking the sweets and like, eating them? Would he agree with it? Yeah. He, um, he didn't want people to told that they had to take it, but he, um, that was part of the work. You know, if they didn't take it, it's fine. If they took it, great. And, you know, it really it completes the work for him in, in, in all ways, you know. But he just didn't want people to be told that you have to take it. Was he a successful artist um, up, up until the time of his death? I mean, I know now everyone is like world renowned, but I often hear that a lot of artists up until the time of their death were like, um, not as successful or it was for themselves and stuff. Yeah, that's something that I was able to sort of see um, for the two, two short years that I lived with him because of, I mean, work with him. But because um, by then he was having, we were preparing for the Guggenheim retrospective, to have a Guggenheim retrospective, even though it was only half the museum, it was with Ross Bruckner. Um, it was a big deal. And even financially, the work, I think around 1990, started to sell. It's for show with Andre Rosen in 1990. Um, financially, he was able to support himself as an artist, and that was a big deal for him. He didn't have to serve plates of spaghetti anymore. So um, he concentrated on his work. And he could buy things, buy things for people. He was you know, really generous with his work. When did he move to the city? 1979. So between like 79 and 90, um, what were some other things that he did? Well, he went to Pratt. Um, he was still doing projects in Puerto Rico. Um, and then that's when he met Julie. It's when he became involved with the material. It's when he had a solo show at the New Museum. And the Rostovsky Gallery, where he showed that first stack on the pedestal. It was a white column show with also another stack on the pedestal um, with Roger Simpson. What were the projects in uh, Puerto Rico? Um, they're like newspaper, uh, um, photo, journalistic, um, uh, newspaper diaries, kind of like. They're in this, actually, they're in this, this book. This was a, a book called Early Impressions about his student work. And um, it was at the Museo del Barrio in 2006. And they had reproductions of some of them. I wanted to show one, but we didn't have it in our files. So I mean, he intentionally didn't really want his early work shown that much because he saw it as studio work. But I think it's interesting these perform these early performances he did with these ephemeral materials and the early New York Times piece that I showed. I think it's interesting, even if a lot of artists wouldn't you know, forget early work that they did, it's still informative work and it has a place in our history. By your, by your um, collection, it's 1998 and you mentioned earlier that you've made paintings. In between like 79 and, and, and 90, how was he, how was he making paintings? A creator. Yeah, yeah. I think he worked in a frame shop. With, he, he may have worked in a frame shop with Julie. He may have done work as an assistant, you know, a studio assistant. Friend of the arts. Yeah, I, that's something that came up at our last. Um, we have a group of fellows that meet uh, about once a year to talk about these issues that come up. Not issues, but just sort of talk about fields of work. Um, Rodney Moore, Julie All, James Inspector, Jane Fondo, uh, and Goldstein. And somebody brought up that they thought that Felix had worked for Joseph Kasuth. And then Julie was like, no, I, I was Joseph Kasuth's 
cleaning lady for a while. <laughs> and I don't think Felix worked for her. So there's all this like mem collective memory that you know people don't and that's why we're doing the oral history project too before we get everything before it passed away. It's interesting to see after the film, you know, copyright the uh, foundation. Have you ever had because the work is kind of uh, useful or automatic, you know, have you ever had to like prosecute someone for a copyright violation? Like I you know, I could copy that work without asking like I take yeah, it's a, it's a big question because copyright is supposed to be for a work that's in a fixed, tangible medium. And arguments can be made that that's not what Felix is working about. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you take an image of the work, um, it's so complex, this whole issue about copyright. <laughs> but um, the images of the work have copyright embedded into them. And um, the estate owns the copyright, or they own the copyright to Felix's work. As a, an artist would own the copyright to their work, and they actually um, have licensed them to us to license to other people when they want to reproduce the work. So that's actually part of what we do. We reproduce, we license images for reproduction. It's a way to see text and things that are written about Felix before they're actually published, and to take the opportunity to say, like, oh, you might want to think about expanding your ideas or fact checking, correcting spellings. He was very specific about lots of things, some things he wasn't specific about. So and we do we license the image we heard a little tiny bit of money from that. But we don't really generally charge for the images. It's like a high end commercial publication. It's just a formality really. It's you know, they have a the copyright here and we just want to keep track. Part of our job is for our time. How long until it's been public domain? I think it's 70 years from its from its death. Yeah. And the self portraits only are they subtractive in additive? Yes. So I assume nobody's ever subtracted anything that do it. You can take it out. It just doesn't. It doesn't take it out permanently. It's always. So it hasn't been installed. It's something subtracted. Like I can see taking out the Obama thing. Well, the Obama thing, it was just for that one installation, for that one sh series of shows. Somebody could put Obama in in the future, but um, the next time it's installed, the person's going to look at the owner if they let the borrower choose to grow the portrait or shrink the portrait. They're going to look at all the choices that you made and say, oh, I just want to do Felix's first installation. Or, no, let's add this. You know, Personal information means something to me that I feel like Felix would have loved for it to be part of his portrait in this installation at such and such museum. So you would so if I wanted to install that, you would you have to borrow it. That you, no, you you have to borrow it from the owner. You have to, oh no, not me personally, but I'm just saying somebody that is going to install it. Like, what do you give them? They have to get permission from the owner to borrow it into that. Once they get that permission, they get a loan form, we provide them with guidelines. It's ideally painted on the wall by a sign painting, which people don't typically do that anymore. It's hard to find some things. But we usually vinyl text on the wall. There's sometimes there's a background color that is optional. Um, and then you have to format it to fit the architecture. It can't be in paragraph format. It has to be like a frieze going around the architecture. So there are all these like guidelines we should It's also it's open, it's meant to be open as well. And I think the portraits are the most nebulous territory in terms of we know with stacks it's like the, the borrower can make these decisions, can pieces of the borrower can make these decisions. Portraits, sometimes it's a dialogue with the owner and the borrower, sometimes it's just like yes, you the curator can make all these decisions, we don't need to prove them, but it's, um, it's a fine line and it's just part of what we do. The light bulbs ever been installed with the the light bulb? No, but um, <laughs> that's a big question too, especially in Europe, because they're they're an outlaw. Well, right now it's only the forty watt, forty watt and above um, incandescents that are being phased out. And <coughs> it's in forty watts haven't been phased out yet, and a lot of people are stop piling bulbs and sockets. But it's also this question of what becomes the standard in the future, because if those 
curly Q LFLs become the standard. Eventually, and that's all that's available. If the works intended to exist, then that's the only way it can exist. And that's the way that it's all. But now we use fields of original choice as a guideline, and we choose either incandescence if we can find them, or um, this new thing called incandescent halogens that are more um, energy efficient, but give off less heat. That came up in Neon Bose installation. He was like, oh, I don't think Felix would like the LFLs because they don't give off heat like the way you know the body would. So these are the things that we that we think about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty fascinated by his lack of a traditional studio practice, like how that affected being able to edit like within the installation and people you know, working with him to edit or that continuing like in his spirit now you know, to show the show. Is that like a um, very conscious decision to just work out of his home and then work in galleries? Yeah. Or? I mean, he could have had a studio, but he, okay. it was intentional. Because I feel like in New York, a lot of the time for working artists, just having a studio and then having a home, like those definitely, the lines get very blurred. Forward, but it was a very conscious. Yeah, I mean, I think everything he did was very intentional. And That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really true. <laughs> I think in the beginning, he couldn't afford a studio. Yeah. And then when he could afford a studio, he realized, no, this is how I, like, this is part of my practice now. Sure. Right. How involved was he in the formation of the foundation? Uh, he did not. The foundation was formed in 2000. And uh, he died in '96. So, and a lot, especially nowadays, artists are more conscious about setting up their foundations before they die. Um, but I think he just had too much to think about and worry about in such a short period of time that he didn't think that far ahead. Um, but so, who, so who, uh, you mentioned Julie and Andrea earlier. Were they like the ones who were the formation of this? Uh, Andrea. Andrea was. I think it had a you know certain childhood memory of him. Like, like a lot of his work has that memory. So I don't recall him being you know, so passionate about <laughs> having candies. I don't remember. I feel like the same flavor came in. <laughs> The, well, there's just sort of hierarchy of decisions we made. Flavor is sort of the least important. Um, it's usually the color of the wrapper, um, or the shape. And so a lot of these candidates that he chose are no longer available. So some people go to the extreme of creating the exact same candy again with a, with a new candy manufacturer. Or some people take embrace the ease of manifestation and just choose whatever's locally available. It may not be exactly the same, but that's Intentional, you know, because the work is supposed to grow and change with each manifestation. What is the degree of sorry, I'm fascinated with this about this aspect, but like what is the degree of specificity <laughs> in the like description? So like a paragraph or a sentence or a line? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a it's a paragraph that describes the original <laughs> And then we have picture uh, images of the original. Is it paragraph publicly? publicly available or did it only become available after you purchased the work? Well there there are honest tickets of authenticity, but if you were to borrow the work, you would get a description of the original candy so that you could use that as a guideline. Um, somebody asked us, I'm sure we'd be happy to give them a description of the original candy. Because for their own location. What's like the day-to-day -day life of those pieces like when they're not in an institution or like being eaten in the world and being called? Like they even just like exist like in a fancy house or like it's what like the people who like you have to interact with people just like have them. Yeah, some of them are still privately owned. Um, the people install them in their houses or 
Or not. Sometimes, you know. Just giving the storage. Yeah. Yeah, well, the thing is, candy only has a certain shelf life. It's right at two years, so. You have to buy the candy. <laughs> 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 There's a certain value in many circumstances as far as I can and uh, there's a constant the dimensionality that the candy occupies at different points. It's so high, it's so high. Does that, does that have a description? No, that's the same principle as the candy choice. It's, you can use Felix's original decisions about the first manifestation as a guideline. But it doesn't have to be corner. Even the bocce, you saw that the bocce was installed in a line. Yes, uh, even though it, in the title it says a corner of bocce. Um, and you can install it in any shape and uh, any weight. And then you make decisions about whether it's replenished, how often it's replenished. They can disappear entirely, or they can be replenished every day. So those are part of the decisions that you make when you borrow the words. Are you thinking of this in terms of the novel model? Most of the things you look at, where it's very, you know, obviously not about that. But there's also, you know, how far do you take that? I mean, if the original candy was silver, um, well, what, how do we, what do we make somebody choosing a you know, purple candy and installing it, you know, in the shape of a shamrock or something? Like how far do you go before it's disrespectful of the original choices that the artist made? And that happened one time, a, a light string, a really much smaller light string was in addition, uh, 24 bolts, really tiny bolts. The curators thought that they could allow the public to install a piece, reinstall a piece. But it's really just the curator has the, the right to reinstall a piece however they want. So anyway, there was during the course of the exhibition, somebody installed the light string. It's like a heart in a heart shape, and we see the picture of it, and we're like, you know, this is so sentimental. You know, it's not something that you would expect a curator to do. And then we found out that was, he was letting the public install the work in that way, and that's that's not part. So you do get to say no, you can't do that, or is it just like we strongly advise you? Yeah, I mean, you have to be diplomatic. <laughs> um, if you had to veto, could you? Well, you, it's, what we usually say is that these, this was not the intention for the work. It was not the artist's original intention to be for it. And it was not the intention for the public to be able to be in some way to be. Where was the public reinstallation? In which city or which place? It was, I don't know, in Virginia somewhere. I don't know exactly where. It was before I started the conversation. And the curator of the institution, I mean, was there ever any other situation where a curator allowed the public to touch and reassemble the work? No, that's the only, only case I know of. I mean, obviously, people touch the work when they take the sheets yes, and the stack and the candies, but no, moving the light string around the means, that was the only case that happens to Seems very strange to Picking up a single candy or several, picking up a sheet is one thing, but that's sharing aspects of the work. To actually bring the public in and say, why don't you rearrange it? Well, I mean, it must have been really confusing for people that came to the Tino show to see the public right. was being regressed. You know, what's going on? And um, one of the ways that it was clear that they were not the public is that sometimes they were wearing white gloves, not all the time. <laughs> the reference women were <laughs> the factors that was. But I think they didn't have much trouble with people trying to like pick up a light string and move it in that show. I think people really thought that it was in the show that Tina's playing a Tina show. Yeah. It also looked like a game in the end. Like I was the one to do that. Yeah, I yeah. Attempted it. A number of public. Well, like this this light string that I was talking about that in the Virginia show where it became a heart. It's a really small light string, and I can see how it's being more liable to somebody being like, well, let me move this around. You also make the case that that was the decision that the curator made then and let the public do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many of your photos 
does um, how many Xeroxes get printed in those stacks, and like how often are they replenished during the course of the show? Um, well, they used to be mostly offset offset printed, um, and now they're digitally printed, uh, and the the way they're replenished depends on the the borrower or the curator. They decide how long to replenish it. How many would they uh, stack? It would say like how many sheets? Yeah, like oh yeah, thousands. Yeah. Um, although it's like not part of the project at all, I'm curious about there being a black market for anything that was physically part of the Felix Gonzalez Corridor's piece, like an original offset print that was part of the stack or a handful of the candies. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen uh, sheets from the stock uh, for sale on eBay. Unframed. And they're promoted as an original work by Felix Gonzalez Taurus. But <laughs> part of the language that's embedded in the certificates is that, and the loan forms, is that a sheet or Group of sheets from the staff do not constitute the work, um, and that's verified by the certificate of the idea of ownership. And um, and I, I mean, my opinion is like if somebody's stupid enough to pay two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars to buy a stack, that's a lithograph, or if that, that's what they want, that's for convenience. Sure. I mean, how can we prevent this person from selling? I mean, it's if I, if I were to like go after this kind of things, like. It would be a full-time job. It's like buying like yeah. concert tickets to a drum roll concert or something. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> a drum roll memorabilia. Plus, you have to pay with the Felix one. Would he do that? What would he really think? I mean, he wouldn't. Oh, sure. He'd just be like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's interesting is, you know, you have your culture from the 90s, and that's always shifting, you know? And our ideas of art and what we're entertained by. And then you have these time captures of these ideas, and they're always going to be kind of hitting at a crossroads where I think that you're going to have technological issues, you're going to have cultural issues, you know, like who's what name is a portrait. And I think that the video is really interesting where it accelerates, it accelerates the work, and you see it changing, the reinstallation. You know, so you know, it's, it's like 20 years in these floor places. Now it's accelerated, and that's a really interesting. Right? You know, the yeah. entire project is awesome. Yeah. yeah. You know. So really having an archive of all of that, and then looking at that after a decade, would really give you a lot of interesting cultural reflection on the work. More essential. Yeah. Just some, yeah. Thoughts. Yeah. The experience that I had uh, visiting Tino's show. It reminded me of the first time I saw Felix's work, which was at the Biennial. And um, I was so confused. I was like, what the hell is going on? Like, there, I saw all these people going down and crouching down. I was like, you can't do that. This is a museum. You know? <laughs> and that experience was so radical for me and informative. Um, and uh, I don't know, just the, the whole thing of seeing all that going on just reminded me of that experience. That's it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting territorial choice to take to assign the reinstallation of work to a set of this. I know of only a limited precedent for that. Um, I can think of Richard Bain's show, um, reinstalling the show that for instance, um, which is definitely not so, so long ago. Um, but like, was the foundation like, really excited about this? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It, like, just like immediately, like, yes, yeah, that's a great idea. And I didn't mention it, but I think uh, the students have the opportunity at some point during the day to install the work without using Tino's instructions. So they could actually do real career curation themselves for one second. But it made me have a whole new appreciation for Tino's Sagal's work. <coughs> Because there's this relationship to dance, and choreography. And we should, we should probably be starting to 
making sure if there are any last questions at all with that block. Are there specs on the go-go boys? Do you have any? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. No, no. There's actually been a few girls. Um, there's the specs, it's like a silver lame bikini. Um, it was walking in but now it's this device of sneakers. It's part of medium. Um, he just had we just did a solo show in Seoul. It's the first uh, uh, solo show in Asia, and so I think we had our first Asian girl dancer there. He was really great, actually. Um, in Seoul, at the Samsung Museum. Um, I mean, they should be fit, I guess. <laughs> 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 Thank you everyone for coming. Hopefully we'll see you two weeks from now.